thanks. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so, uh, as she said, I um, was at Kaggle. Probably most people here are familiar with Kaggle. Um, we host these predictive modeling competitions. Um, for a while, no longer, but um, I was involved with a part of the company that was actually pretty separate from that, doing predictive modeling for the oil and gas industry. Um, so that was that was not through our competition platform. That was a, a whole separate thing. Um, so I guess for a while I've been interested in kind of physical world stuff. Um, that was, uh, and now I've gone from helping the oil and gas companies drill better to trying to save energy uh, in in homes. So um, that's with with a company called Sense Labs. I. Only been with them for a few weeks now, but uh, hopefully I've learned enough to tell you some interesting things about, about what we're doing. Uh, so we built this hardware, uh, which goes in your house, and this app that uses the hardware sensor to tell you all sorts of things about what's going on in your house. Um, so the, the idea here is rather than a home being all these disconnected things to um, kind of tell you about everything that's going on uh, around the house. Um, and so, the you've heard a lot about the like, smart home and all this. The, the kind of the thing that's different here is we're not um, at this point anyway. We're not trying to control the the device. We're not uh, turning things on and off or whatever. We're just um, just sensing what's going on as a starting point and doing that from one single split place. Kind of rather than having to instrument each individual device or outlet to make your um, home smart. Uh, we, we just have to measure where the power comes into the house. Um, and so I'll get, into, uh, I'll get later into how we measure in that one place and still tell you about the individual devices. That's kind of my job. Um, but sort of going into the point of all this a little bit, um, we sort of provide all this information to the user, right? So the, the goals there are, there's a few goals. Um, hopefully efficiency to help people save energy. Um, also make things more reliable. So if we can detect what's going wrong with your fridge and tell you what's, what uh, kind of diagnose things early, right? Uh, and also just make everything more convenient, right? So you um, uh, you left the house to go to work, and we can let you know, hey, did you remember to close the garage door or not? Or is the um, is the drive the, the iron been on for the last thirty minutes, and you should get a notification that that, that should turn off. And so, and then as this says, later, later on, automation and control um, come into play, perhaps, but uh, but not, not yet. Um, so efficiency uh, is about stop, um, not wasting energy, right? So a lot of energy goes into homes. About 25 percent of of the energy uh, in the U.S. total energy. Time. So that includes oil, and gas, all sorts of things, is used for electricity in homes. Um, and 50 of that, 50 uh, percent of that, I think, half. Uh, could be saved with changes that don't uh, on net cost anything. So we could save a lot of energy. Um, then, and also we can make your home more reliable, right? So uh, notifications about the furnace breaking or all sorts of things. Um, and also convenience. So um, that's that's kind of what the goal is. And then how do we do it, right? Uh, this is an electrical box. Um, there's these wires. Uh, I don't know anything about electricity, or I didn't anyway until I started. Um, that's been one of the interesting things. So if, if anyone in the audience knows more than me, wants to jump in, we can make it a conversation. Um, but there's these wires, and uh, they represent two channels that come into the home, right? So there's uh, AC current is this sine wave uh, oscillating at 60 hertz. So each cycle is uh, 60 of a second. And the two channels are uh, offset from each other, 180 degrees, so they're flipped. Um, so then, what most of your appliances are 120 volts there. If if something's using bulk channels, like a, an electric dryer or an electric stove, then you can get up to 240 volts. Um, so um, the this is this is for residential homes. In offices or apartment buildings, you'll often see these um, these three phase situations where instead of the two phases being offset uh, 180 degrees from each other, you've got three phases, each offset 120 degrees. So, um, and then only two of the phases will go into an individual apartment. So this, um, 
it, then you can only get to, instead of the 240 volts, I think it's only 210 that you can get using two of these bases because they're not perfectly offset. Um, so then what do we, um, what do we use to do what we do? We have the total, um, the current voltage for those two channels individually. Um, and, uh, but again, that's not measuring anything about individual devices at that point. It's just the whole house is uh, two channels going in. So the two channels are separate, but other than that, everything's all combined. Um, and we're measuring at fairly high frequency. So the, um, the main problem I'll talk about today is how we approach um, disaggregating that. Right? My job is mainly about disaggregating that signal into the individual devices so we can tell uh, kind of pull up that report and the app to tell you individual devices or a timeline showing what's going on with all the individual devices or trends saying kind of where, which devices use the most power. Um, so taking that uh, combined signal and disaggregating it into individual devices is kind of the, the data science problem here. Um, and so what are some features of this problem are uh, there's many different kinds of signals we, we use. So it's a very, at very different time scales. Um, so I'll talk about that a bit. Um, it's also very difficult to get good ground truth. So you can, you can try to measure individual devices uh, and sort of treat that as ground truth to train an algorithm that applies to the aggregate signal of all these people's houses. It turns out that doesn't get you, that's not great because what's going on, what the, what the individual device looks like when you measure it on its own is kind of different from how it shows up in the aggregate signal. Um, so it's, it's pretty hard to get good ground truth here. Uh, we've, we've learned enough that we, as human beings, can look at the aggregate signal and kind of see individual devices and figure out what we think those mean. Um, so we know, we know there's enough information here to solve the problem. And uh, so that's, at least that's a good, that's a good sign. We can, um, and then the next step is to try to figure out how to get the algorithms to do that. Um, so then another, another feature of the problem I'll talk about is we have to, um, a lot of this code has to run on the, in the device itself. So there's a little computer chip that has not that much memory, not that much CPU uh, in the dilemma that we put in the electrical box there. And we can't afford to send all of the data we need to the cloud and process there. So we have to actually run the algorithm right there on the box. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about sort of different needs for different kinds of views. So that um, how we approach the problem, you might think we kind of do it all at once, uh, which we do, but um, then different, um, so there's sort of a unified, a unified view to how we solve this problem with then different features and facts come out in different views in the app. And um, that optimizes for different things. So, um, this is, uh, so then first I'm talking about the, the different signal spaces. Um, there's kind of stuff happening at very different frequencies. There's a, um, fast transitions. So this is a, uh, incandescent light turning on and there's this jolt of, uh, current right when it first turns on and then much less. And that, that takes about 30 milliseconds. So it's a really quick, uh, really quick transition. Um, each of those, so this is going back to right, a, how AC works. You see those, those squiggles of current up and down. Each of those is the 1 60th, 60th of a second AC cycle that I mentioned. Um, and right, so uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, we have much slower things happening where you can see uh, this is an air conditioner slowly ramping up over a few minutes. Um, so very quick or much slower. Kind of big, uh, big difference in the time scales here. Um, or um, here we have another fairly slow cycling going on with a dishwasher, I think that is. Um, so the whole, it's about uh, 60 seconds is shown there, so each, each of those cycles is about 20 seconds. Um, then we have much more, uh, there's other interesting things going on at the very high frequency of the spectrum. So 
uh, very kind of do your Fourier analysis and look at the different uh, how much power there is at different frequencies. Um, and this is that same incandescent light turning off, but um, this is at a high frequency much higher than what you see in the the one sixteenth of a second cycle. This is uh, this is uh, way it's going on much faster than that. Um, so here's um, here's another incandescent light turning on. Uh, a few different shots of the same one. So kind of you see a little bit of it's not exactly the same pattern all the time. Um, or we um, so we often visualize things uh, on the cycle level, right? So instead of those oscillations that happen, uh, so this, if you're looking at a resolution much faster than a cycle, this is what you see. Here we've averaged across each cycle. So the, um, the flat bars are each a sixtieth of a second there, and we're looking at kind of average current for, for a given cycle. And we see that jump up and then come back down. Or in an, uh, this is a compact glass of light with a very different kind of um, sawtooth pattern to the, the current. Um, or here's an electric dryer turning on. Uh, so it's drawing kind of similar to what goes on with the, the light bulb. It's drawing more current when it first turns on and then it that flattens off just a little bit. Um, so that's a, just a short tour of some of the many different kinds of signals we, we would look at. Um, then, so what do we do about this problem that it's very difficult to get good ground truth? Um, there's a lot of manual effort that goes into this right now, to be honest. So we can't um, we can't just machine just kind of apply machine learning to everything. We think of this more as an engineering problem than a machine learning problem a lot of the time. Um, and so uh, different parts of the process have uh, either humans labeling ground truth that we can then judge against, or humans kind of explicitly creating a model that we then, uh, even for an individual device, that we then apply uh, um, in, in production. So there's the whole production process right now has, has a lot of, uh, has some manual steps. And the, um, the idea is to kind of gradually automate as much of that as possible. Uh, but it's okay to have. Um, Kind of the first first thing you want to do is get something working. Um, so, and then another, um, without ground truth, we can still apply heuristics that tell us about how well things are working. So, you say the device turned on, uh, later you say it turned off. If you can identify the individual on and off events, well, how well do your on and offs match up? Right? Things like that will tell you uh, if the, the algorithm is making sense at all. Um, so, um, another, right. so the code, as I said, the code runs uh, on the device in real time, which means we have to build a model that can be applied kind of quickly on the device at the time. So that doesn't sort of we're working with memory constraints. Um, the um, we uh, so. For music purposes, we are sending a lot of the higher frequency data up to our servers, um, but we know that most of the time, so that's happening with some of our beta users. Uh, for in real life, we won't be able to do that. Um, we ended up paying for some of our beta users to have a higher, uh, a better internet connection so we could actually get that data. Um, but uh, in real life, we've got to be able to run without without ever having access to that data except on the device itself. Um, and then, uh, right, so different, um, different parts of our app will have different needs, right? So if we're gonna alert you that the dryer is done, we, we don't wanna do that if we're gonna have false positives. We don't want you walking downstairs, checking the dryer, and we're wrong that it's done. Um, so that's gotta have a very low false positive rate. Um, which, and this is what I'm working on now, uh, the, the, tricky, the, the somewhat tricky thing about that is the fact that the dryer uh, cycles on and off, right? The heating element turns on, heats for a while, turns off again. So we've got to um, 
just because the heating element for the dryer turned off doesn't mean the whole dryer cycle is done. So kind of figuring that out. Um, the, uh, the timeline, uh, we can, we have more, um, we can be more accurate there because we don't need to, uh, real alerts need to be in real time, whereas the timeline we can kind of go and try to historically figure out what's the best model of what happened here. Um, but just like the alerts, these bubble plots, you saw a screenshot of the app earlier where it just showed kind of what, what things were on. That is to adjust in real time. When, when someone first gets this app, they walk around their house turning things on and off to see what the bubble, like is the, the bubble showing the this device. Um, and if that doesn't respond in real time, then they're going to think this app is no good. Um, so uh, just a, a bunch of different kinds of uh, needs there. Um, and right, so different. Um, different techniques used for the different types of signals I talked about before. Um, so, and then combining all of that to a search framework. So taking, taking all those signals, sending it to the search framework, and using that to kind of search for what's the best explanation for everything we're, we're seeing, which, which devices do we think are on or, or not on, and so on. Um, and then we're, not, we're certainly not using all the, um, all the signals we possibly could right now, so just kind of thinking about where are we going to get the largest gains first, and, and doing that first. Um, and um, kind of a, having in mind what, what, what are we going to work on later. As I mentioned, lots of, some manual effort at, at various points right now. Um, that later becomes either semi or, or fully automated. Um, if, if it can't ever be fully automated, that's actually fine, uh, as long as it doesn't take too much manual effort. Um, and then uh, much later, I mean, I mentioned sort of energy saving, right? But a lot of that energy saving is going to happen through changes in human behavior. So then the, the human being who, human beings who live in this house are a whole element of the system that I haven't talked about so far, but um, kind of thinking about what, what cues will appropriately change their behavior to, to do things that, that save energy for them. And, and figuring out kind of work, what works best there will be another aspect of this. Um, great, so that was a uh, that was a pretty short talk, uh, but I'll stop here for questions, and we can maybe chat a little bit. Um, yeah. Is this uh, no. And the reason I mentioned is they are a company that does exactly this, but for factories of high energy consumption. Yeah, there's probably some similarities in the problem there. Uh, we're very, right now, we're very, very focused on the consumer uh, and, uh, and direct to consumer as well. So it's not, um, right, for now, it's not, yeah. Uh, and sorry, before we, uh, before I take more questions, I should, I should apologize first that I'm going to be a little bit cagey about some aspects of the, how the algorithm works. I realized I didn't share a ton of details, but hopefully should show some interesting data and interesting some ideas about how we approach it. Um, but I, I will both say everything. Uh, question? Yes. So there's a fair bit of, uh, of research on the topic. Of yeah, that's right. Uh, how, much of, how much of that have you found useful, and how much of that have you found to be too academic? We found a lot of it to be pretty academic. So the, um, all of the Let's see, most of the data I showed was real data from our sensors. Um, some, I think the, um, actually all of it, everything I showed was real data from our sensors, uh, which, and so the, um, that's, uh, I think we found that to be just a whole different ballgame from kind of what the, uh, most of the academics are looking at in, in labs and so on, and um, so it's a bit of a different, Noisier, different. Uh, yeah. So I think maybe uh, maybe good for some ideas, but not really. Okay. Let's go over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a, a cost enhanced that? Short answer that I don't know. I think it shouldn't. Um, that should be. 
That certainly makes sense. Um, the, I think we're, more, I mean, we're mostly interested in that next step of seeing how it all breaks down between the different devices. Um, but as a first step, kind of matching it up with what they're trying to make sense. Again, I'm not, I'm not sure.
voltage actually comes from the power supply for the device itself. So you just plug it in, and voltage uh, throughout the house is pretty, uh, you can measure that basically anywhere. So just measure it at the power supply for the device itself. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you've done most of the time you're the question and then you're the monitor. I'm the monitor, yeah. Now, the reality of what you're talking about here is, uh, can you talk a little bit about the analysis of the running and the running on the server? The principle, I'm going with running on the server. Yeah. Um, there's, I shouldn't talk about much about that well, but like for the most part, what's happening? Um, so we're like we're sending data up to EC2. It's coming down to the server, the like servers in our office, um, and that's where we do. That's kind of where I run from. Right? I do the um, research to identify patterns and, and whatever um, whatever we see there. So. So you sending your raw data to Yeah, we're sending um, we're sending some raw data all the time. So kind of a smaller version of the raw data. And then the, the biggest version of the raw data with kind of all the samples we take, uh, we send that uh, for about, uh, I think, I know for employees' houses, we're sending that for one hour of the day. We might not be sending, collecting any of it for users' houses, just because we, we don't want to use up that much of their bandwidth to send to it. The high, um, the high frequency data. Yep. So, you know, what is the analysis of the house using this service? Is that $100 or what is the whole part? But what does it cost? Yeah, there are reasons. I only have time to question. Yep. Um, the, I wonder if what I can, definitely not much less than $1,000. Uh, to, so the model is to sell the device um, and then charge nothing for the, the ongoing processing and service. Um, so that um, the device will sell for know, less than less than five hundred dollars. Uh, we've got a. We'd love to be in your house. <laughs> uh, yes, that's sensehome.com. We've got the domain sense.com, so that should work again. That should work in a few weeks. And there's a launch coming up. Um, so we've only got kind of a limited selection of beta users right now, but pretty soon anyone will be able to uh, go get the device. Yeah, based in terms of a, the signal processing issue, did you? try to do this on a circuit by circuit basis in order to kind of separate out the signal a little bit better because I imagine if you're doing just one unit for the entire run going into the house you must have a whole heck of a lot of noise if you just separated out the kitchen circuit you get rid of so much of that thing yeah that's a, so that's a great question I'm now I'm just guessing here because uh, I don't think I was I haven't actually talked to anyone about this and I wasn't around for the history of that those discussions but I, I would guess that the decision came down to trying to minimize the cost of the device itself as much as possible. Um, so having as few sensors as we absolutely need on it in order to um, sell it as cheap as we can. But uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, thanks.